the morning. Would y'all please stand and sing with us? A thousand generations falling down in worship to sing the song of ages to the Lamb. And all who've gone before us and all who will believe will sing the song of ages to the Lamb. Your name is the highest, your name is the greatest, your name stands above them all. All thrones and dominions, all powers and positions,
That's sweet. <laughs> Trying to figure out exactly what this hides. I think that'll be fine. Uh, it's my uh, pleasure to get an opportunity to address you twice in the same turn, once dressed as a 6'1 Japanese man, <laughs> and now as, apparently according to the chapel slides, the coming king. Uh, <laughs> I'd, like to, uh, I'd like to maybe correct that if anybody was confused. I'm not the coming king, uh, although I'm ruddy and handsome. I'm not, uh, I'm not tall enough. I think I'm shorter than David, so. Let's look at Matthew chapter one, verse one, please. Matthew chapter one, verse one. Matthew's my favorite book in the Old Testament. I know there's this uh, page here that says New Testament, but you can mostly disregard that. Um, it says, an account of the genealogy of Jesus Christ, the son of David, the son of Abraham. And we ought on reading that to have a question, and the question should be, whatever is a Christ, uh, perhaps a last name, what is the son of David? And in our text, in our work through Samuel with the... Uh, faculty this year, we're coming to begin to answer that question. What is a Christ? What is the son of David? And you really can't make sense of what an outstanding, outrageous claim this is here at the beginning of Matthew, uh, unless you've got a sense of what the son of David and the son of Abraham is. It doesn't sound like much of a claim. It just sounds like uh, we're mentioning this guy's parents. But this is an astonishing claim, as it turns out, and all the work back here, this part, is a preparation for understanding what that means and for receiving it with real, full joy. This isn't something we can skip. And in the story of Samuel's, uh, I think we run into a bit of a tendency maybe to skip, in part because there's certain key moments that have kind of inflection points uh, we sort of know what they're about. You know, maybe we've even seen the animated version. And uh, there's a real danger in that, actually. I must have offended Dr. Rogers because he asked me to talk about uh, David's anointing and David and Goliath. And I don't think there's a more fun... I mean, everybody's heard that one if they've heard one, I think. You know, who's your Goliath? How many stones have you got? And this type of stuff, right? Um, it almost breeds itself. And then it's like, ugh, is there anything for us here? Um, I think so. But the way we get at it is by reading a whole narrative. And I'm afraid since we come to Matthew 1.1 1, 1 and we see son of David, the Christ, the son of Abraham, and we kind of like know what those bold words mean, um, we're not able really to appreciate the depth of their significance, and that makes our reading, particularly of long passages in the Old Testament, somewhat stale to us. That's the concern that I have. And in part that's because we're not terribly good at reading narratives. We kind of think we've got the punchline, we know what the kind of point of it is, and so then when we come to the narrative, the main idea is to try to like figure out what we should like do. You know, what can I do? And so you read a story about David and, and you think like, well, how can I be like David? You know, I want to run in there and, and, and be a part of it, and of course you do. Who wouldn't want to act in a way that was pleasing to God? But part of what we have to get right in listening to something that is a history and a prophecy uh, is that the main thing for you to do really is listen. Things to imitate, absolutely. Principles to learn about this and that, absolutely. But the main thing is to listen for the, the main thing, and that requires something that's extraordinarily difficult, which is patience. And the narratives of the Old Testament, they demand that kind of patience. The author will get to the point he wants to make in his own good time. And the waiting is not like boring through a whole bunch of details and mountains, nobody knows where they are and all this kind of stuff. It's laying the kind of groundwork so that when we come to a text like Matthew and we go, okay, Jesus now, great. You can really feel the, 
sense of joy that comes with having anticipated that moment. We're in a season of that kind of anticipation now, I noticed, since uh, everyone wants to skip Thanksgiving and just have uh, trees everywhere. Have you noticed this? It's bizarre. I like my trees on the outside. <laughs> it's uh, one of the main reasons I went for a house. Uh, but here we are with the trees. And they're, they're very pretty, you know, that's nice. Um, I like them better in logs inside walls. Everybody's anticipating that, right? When it gets to be July, what do my children want to listen to in the car? What music do you want to listen to? Is it George Strait? Nope, that's the rest of the year. In July, it's, let's listen to Christmas music. I'm like, not yet. <laughs> not yet. You can't. And then there's some uh, movie, you know, going on. And it's like, oh, it's a Christmas movie in July. Won't that be fun? I'm like, no. <laughs> not yet. Why are you so impatient? Uh, it's shocking. And then finally we're getting close to the temperature goes down a little bit. You get your coat out in October. People are like, Christmas? I'm like, no. <laughs> no. You have to be patient. We've compromised in my house. I go to a conference the week before Thanksgiving and while I'm gone, everybody decorates. <laughs> like, I come back and it's Christmas. I was gone for a lot longer than I intended. <laughs> what is this anticipation that we have, right? We know something special is going to happen. There's gifts, there's songs everybody knows, families around. I don't know, there's lots of unusual foods that apparently it's wrong to eat at other times of year. And it's just difficult for us to like, wait. I think that's a difficulty we have in the Christian life also. It's difficult to just, not yet. The time will come. And when the time comes, the coming king you just watch him do what he does, and you praise him for it. At the beginning of Samuel, we have this song from Hannah, which you, I don't know, 10 weeks ago or something we went through. And it serves as a kind of summary of God's activity in general. It says something about his character. It tells us what he's gonna be like. And it ends with this stuff about his anointed, the anointed one. God will exalt the horn of his anointed. And we see more than one person get anointed in the book. We're trying to figure out which of these guys is going to do it, which of these guys is going to be the king. Now, the king is supposed to be God, a point which is not lost on Samuel. When it comes time for Israel to demand a king, Samuel doesn't think it's a good idea. And the Lord says to him in chapter 8, listen to the people and everything they say. They haven't rejected you. They've rejected me as their king. That's not a good move. Saul is anointed Hasn't the Lord anointed you ruler over his inheritance? Chapter 10. And yet Saul is not characterized by success, as we learned two weeks ago from uh, Dr. Marsh, because the type of worship that pleases God, he said, worship in which the Lord delights, comes from obedience and wholeheartedness. And we don't find that among the people. They've been warned profusely by Samuel that they should fear the Lord and worship him faithfully with all their heart. And yet we don't find that that's the way Saul conducts himself. And the people have not conducted themselves for a long time. That's what this book back here is about. God tells uh, Samuel, who tells Saul in chapter 13, the Lord has found a man after his own heart. The Lord appointed him ruler over his people because you have not done what the Lord commanded. And so Saul has been, chapter 15, rejected as king. Because you rejected the word of the Lord, he has rejected you as king. Because you rejected the word of the Lord, the Lord has rejected you from being king over Israel. There's been this pattern through the whole book that helps establish a kind of narrative flow. And they're very basic techniques. They're techniques everybody's already going to know. The question is whether we have the patience to read the whole thing and kind of look for them. Or whether we're trying to like get somewhere a little early. The Christmas tree before Thanksgiving. 
Or maybe God help us in July. Let's look at chapter 16. The Lord said to Samuel, how long will you mourn for Saul since I have rejected him as king over Israel? Fill your horn with oil and go. I send you to Jesse of Bethlehem because I have selected a king from his sons. Samuel asked, how can I go? Saul will hear about it and kill me. The Lord answered, take a cow with you and say, I have come to sacrifice to the Lord. Then invite Jesse to the sacrifice, and I will let you know what you should do. You will anoint the one that I named to you. Samuel did what the Lord directed and went to Bethlehem. When the elders of the town met him, they trembled and asked, do you come in peace? In peace, he replied, I come to sacrifice to the Lord. Consecrate yourselves and come with me to the sacrifice. And he consecrated Jesse and his sons and invited them to the sacrifice. When they arrived, Samuel saw Eliab and said, certainly the Lord's anointed before him, right? Apparently the guy was tall. Uh, and here we have something you could bracket, verse seven. The Lord said to Samuel, don't look at his appearance or his stature because I have rejected him. God does not see as a man sees, for humans see according to the eyes, and the Lord sees the heart. This is a part of this pattern that we've seen. The things I told you every story sort of has that you kind of already know, but we have to have the patience to look for it. One of the ways that they narrate the value, the prophets, is by establishing contrasts or juxtapositions, and the other way is by repetition. They say the same kind of thing again, they highlight the features of a story again, or they try to set two characters off against one another. That isn't principally so we could imitate the good guy and not imitate the bad guy. Although, all things equal, you should imitate the good guy and not imitate the bad guy. The principle is so that you can kind of see what God wants. So this sort of idea that God doesn't see as a man sees, he doesn't judge in the way that a man judges, according to the eyes, but rather he sees the heart. That's not an invitation for us to go and judge in a radically different way so much as it is an invitation to let the living word of God teach you how to see things the right way. And that's what happens in the rest of this section. If you go back and look at chapter 10, in verse 23, Saul, who has been received as the king, is hiding. <laughs> and they go and get him out. And when he stands up, he's a head taller than all of the other people. And Samuel told the people, do you see the one the Lord has chosen? There's no one like him among the entire population. So here comes Eli El Eliab, and he's big, he's the oldest. He's the first one Jesse brings out. And it's the same sort of judgment. Maybe it's this guy. That isn't to make us think, oh, no, don't pick the tall guy, right? Pick the short younger brother. Right? Although God has a preference for younger brothers, it seems like. Um, it isn't so we ought to pick the person who looks less capable of doing the job. And I think sometimes we read it that way. Sometimes we, we read it in a way that's intended to be encouraging, right? Like you don't think you're very worth very much, or you're very capable, or you have talent, or this or that, or the other kind of thing. And somebody wants to say to you, actually God can use you, because God's like really big and it doesn't very really matter much if you're little, right? And then you get little, guy, little guys can do big things, you know, this kind of thing. Um, nothing wrong with that, because that turns out to be true. Uh, I know, I've seen me do it. Um, <laughs> but that's not really the point. The point is sort of the heart, and the heart doesn't have anything to do with the stature. You're not more likely to have a bad heart if you're tall than if you're short. It's that it's irrelevant. <laughs> it has nothing to do with it. And what we see is, in the rest of the book, David's heart in contrast to Saul's. That comes out strongly in the next chapter, chapter 18, strong contrast between the type of spirit they have, David's refusal to lay his hand against an anointed of God, even though he's an anointed of God, his heart of repentance later on when he fails, and he fails massively. God's looking at the heart, that's the point. And this notion of the eyes and the notion of the heart, that's something that the author, Samuel, is playing with to try to make sense of something for us. The Lord sees the heart. That's what he was after. 
a man after his own heart. Verse 8, Jesse called Abinadab and presented him to Samuel, and the Lord hasn't chosen this one either. And Samuel said, and then Jesse presented Shema, and Samuel said, the Lord hasn't chosen this one either. And after Jesse presented seven of his sons to him, Samuel said to Jesse, the Lord hasn't chosen any of these. Are all your sons here? There is still the youngest, he answered, but he's tending the sheep. Samuel told Jesse, go get him. We won't sit down to eat until he gets here. And so he sent for him. And how would we judge this man according to the eyes? He had beautiful eyes. He was ruddy. He was handsome. And the Lord said, anoint him. He's the one. It's hard to know according to the eyes what was different. You might have noticed in scripture we rarely get the kinds of uh, descriptions of people that we might like. Have you noticed this? You almost never get an internal psychological description of anybody or like what do people look like. It almost never comes up. Have you noticed that? Occasionally it does, right? The guy had a leather belt. Like, ooh, like those are usually important in some way, right? And, uh, and so the tendency, I think, when we're reading the, the stories is to try to like maybe color them in. Does that make sense? Try to make them seem alive in some way, right? You know, imagine it, da 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 right? That's fine. But sometimes what that does is distracts us from when there is a description. <laughs> like, why was that in there? Like, oh, that's a handsome kid. Like, what were we expecting, right? Um, but apparently that doesn't have anything to do with why he was chosen. We judge according to the eyes, and God judges the heart. Samuel took the horn of oil and anointed him in the presence of his brothers, and the Spirit of the Lord came powerfully on David from that day forward. And Samuel set out, and he went to Ramah. Now, the Spirit of the Lord had left Saul. An evil spirit from the Lord began to torment him. So Saul's servant said to him, You see an evil spirit from the Lord is tormenting you? Let our Lord command your servants here in the presence to look for someone who knows how to play the harp. Whenever the evil spirit from God comes on you, that person can play the harp and you'll feel better. And Saul said, get me someone like that and bring him to me. And one of the young men answered, I've seen a son, Jesse of Bethlehem, who knows how to play. He's a valiant man, a warrior, eloquent, handsome. The Lord is with him. Well, this isn't like little baby David. This guy can play harp well enough for a king. And he's handsome. <laughs> Watch out. <laughs> then Saul dispatched messengers to Jesse and said, send me your son David with the sheep. And Jesse took a donkey loaded with bread and a wineskin and a goat and sent them by his son David to Saul. And when David came to Saul and entered his service, Saul loved him much. And David was his armor bearer. And Saul sent word to Jesse, let David remain in my service, for he has found favor in my eyes. When the Spirit from God came on Saul, David would play the harp, and Saul would be relieved and feel better, and the Spirit would leave him. Now we have this unusual situation in the story, which is we're really not done talking about Saul yet. That goes on through the rest of the book. But here's David and he's been anointed. And like, he's all right, right? Um, and we still have the problem of the Philistines. And that's the subject of the next chapter. How will God deliver his people again from the Philistines in spite of themselves? Chapter 17. The Philistines gathered their forces for war at Sukkot and Judah and encamped between Sukkot and Azka and Ephesh Saul and the men of Israel gathered together and camped in the Valley of Elah, and they lined up to battle formation to face the Philistines. The Philistines were standing on one hill, and the Israelites were standing on another hill, and there was a valley between them. And a champion, Goliath from Gath, came out from the Philistine camp. He was nine foot nine, or you might have six foot nine. One old manuscript has that he was 10,000 feet tall. I think that's probably not right. Um, <laughs> He was very, very big. He wore a bronze helmet, and he wore bronze armor of scales that weighed 125 pounds, like a big snake. 
There was bronze armor on his shins, and a bronze javelin was slung between his shoulders. His spear shaft was like a weaver beam, and the iron point of his spear weighed 15 pounds. I think it's more fun when it says shekels. I'm going to call them about that. Pounds, I don't know, that takes something out of it, doesn't it? I mean, I know there's equivalencies, but shekels. <laughs> in addition, a shield bearer was walking in front of him. He stood and shouted to the Israelite battle formation, why do you come out to line up in battle formation? Am I not a Philistine? Are you not servants of Saul? Choose one of your men and have him come down against me. If he wins in a fight against me and kills me, we will be your servants. But if I win against him and kill him, then you will be our servants and you will serve us. And the Philistine said, I defy the ranks of Israel today. Send me a man so we might fight each other. And when Saul and all Israel heard these words from the Philistine, they lost their courage and were terrified. So the point of having the king was for him to go out in battle and come in after in battle. That was the point of having the king. That was the point of rejecting God as king and having this tall guy. And what we find is that's not happening. They have a taller guy. <laughs> it's not unlike God crushes all the Egyptians with water, kerplunk, and then he's like, go look at the land and how awesome it is. And they're like, but they are very big and we are out of melons. <laughs> this is not a people who are worshiping God from an obedient heart. David doesn't have that problem. Look at verse 32. Don't let anyone be discouraged by him. Your servant will go and fight this Philistine. Sweet, right? Sounds a little presumptuous. In fact, in the, the longer version in the center of this, Eliab accuses him of having an evil heart for wanting to be obedient because he sees the wrong things. Saul said, you can't go fight this Philistine. You're just a youth. And he's been a warrior since he was a youth. David answered, your servant's been tending his father's sheep. Whenever a lion or a bear came, have you read this? This is unbelievable. Whenever a lion or a bear came and carried off a lamb from the flock, I went after it and struck it down. And I rescued the lamb from its mouth. If it reared up against me, I'd grab it by its beard and strike it down and kill it. That is awesome. Like, this guy's awesome. He plays the harp well enough for a king, and he's like, oh, bear. Oh, lion. Like, this isn't some little asparagus. You guys have seen that one. <laughs> Your servant has killed lions and bears. This uncircumcised Philistine will be like one of them, for he has defied the armies of the living God. That's not how he said it. He said he was defying the ranks of Israel. But God had said, these are my people. David said, the Lord who rescued me from the paw of the lion and the paw of the bear will rescue me from the hand of this Philistine. So he's attributing all success he will have to God. And that's because he has an obedient heart. That's what the author is trying to show you. Saul said to David, go and may the Lord be with you. Saul had his own military clothes put on David, a bronze helmet on David's head and armor. And David strapped the sword on his military clothes and he tried to walk, but he wasn't used to him. He never worn armor before. He hasn't been a warrior from his youth like Goliath. I can't walk in these. I'm not used to them. So he took them off. Instead, he took a staff in his hand and chose five smooth stones from the river and put them in the pouch in the shepherd's bag. 
Then with his sling in his hand, he approached the Philistine. Now, why did he choose five? Why does it say five stones? Okay? This is like everybody's go-to-town hootenanny point, and it's awesome, and I love it. I can't do it. It would seem saccharine. You may have seen my face or heard my voice. I don't, I don't have that. The church fathers, they loved this. They were like five stones, five books of Moses. Coincidence? <laughs> uh, and pretty much every time they saw a five or a ten, they did that. Like ten, five books twice, ten commandments. <laughs> Why does he just need one stone? Unity. When he goes to the battle, he takes an ephah flower. Why? Three measures. Get it? Trinity, anyone? <laughs> None of that is really the point. The reason there's five, says that he picked up five is because that's how many he picked up. <laughs> he put them in his pouch. Man, I love me some Augustine, though. When Augustine, I'm going to take a minute. When Augustine does this <laughs> sermon on David and Goliath, it's actually not on Samuel. It's on Psalm 144, uh, which in his, the, his Latin version of an old Greek version has Goliath at the top. David says that the Lord has trained my hands for war and made my fingers fit for battle. So he goes, oh, it's gotta be about Goliath. So they wrote Goliath at the top. So he's talking about this. And he goes, I mean, it's a doozy, it's incredible. It preaches great, right? Like he's like, da 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 and it's awesome. And of course, that's what he trained for was oratory. Um, and in the middle of the sermon, this is fantastic. Some people get up and leave in the back. And we know because he stops what he's doing and he starts getting after them. And whoever's like writing this down for posterity just keeps writing it. <laughs> He's like, oh, there's some people who don't want to be prepared when he comes. Yikes. <laughs> right? And then he goes back to his numerology, so. I won't do that. The Philistine came closer and closer to David with a shield bearer in front of him. And when the Philistine looked and saw David, he despised him because he was just a kid, ruddy and handsome. I don't like those guys either. <laughs> he said to David, am I a dog that you come at me with sticks? This kid with his staff, come on. And then he said, and then he cursed David by his gods. Now we know about his gods from chapter five. You might remember reading that 111 years ago. Chapter five, what's going on there? That's all about Dagon. And look what it says in verse four about Dagon in chapter five, when the ark was placed by him. When they got up early in the morning, there was Dagon, fallen with his face on the ground before the ark of the Lord. About to have a repetition. Come here, the Philistine called to David, and I will give your flesh to the birds of the sky and the wild beasts. David said to the Philistine, you come against me with sword, spear, and javelin, but I come against you in the name of the Lord of hosts, the God of the ranks of Israel. You have defied him. Today the Lord will hand you over to me. Today I will strike you down, cut off your head, and give the corpses of the Philistine camp to the birds of the sky and the wild creatures of the earth. Then all the world will know that Israel has a God, and this whole assembly will know that it was not by sword or by spear that the Lord saves, for the battle is the Lord's, and he will hand you over to us. And the Philistine started forward to attack him. David ran to the battle line to meet the Philistine and he put his hand in the bag and he took out his stone and he slung it and he hit the Philistine in the forehead. The stone sank into his forehead and he fell face down to the ground. He has crushed the forehead of his enemy. David defeated the Philistine with a sling and a stone. He overpowered the Philistine and killed him without having a sword. He ran and stood over him grabbing the sword. He pulled it from his sheath and killed him, cut off his head. And when the Philistines saw that their hero was dead, they fled. And the men of Israel and Judah rallied, shouting their battle cry, and chased the Philistines to the entrance of the valley and to the gates of Ekron. Philistine bodies were strewn all along the Sha'arim road to Gath and Ekron. And when the Philistines returned from the pursuit, or the Israelites returned from the pursuit of the Philistines, they plundered their camps. And David took that Philistine's head and brought it to Jerusalem and he put Goliath's weapons in his own tent. This is the Lord's anointed. When you see David, you see the Lord's anointed. He has an obedient heart. He crushes the forehead of his enemy. He's from the right kind of a line. 
And he shows that kind of faithfulness, that kind of open-heartedness, full-heartedness, wholeheartedness toward God for the rest of the book. But he isn't perfect, which we'll read about next term. He falls short of God's glory. In what sense is he kind of an icon or an image or a type for us? Only the extent to which the author displays that, his wholeheartedness, his wholehearted pursuit of God, his confidence in the victory that God had said the people would have over the Philistines. When you see him, you see the Lord's anointed, his Mashiach, his Messiah. And then when we go through all of the rest of the book and we're waiting for one like him and we come to this story in Matthew and it's like, hey, I found the son of this one. Something changes. Because when you look at David, you see what God does to rescue his people in spite of how hapless they are and haphazard, how backward and silly. The way that they've not been trained to judge according to the heart and not merely according to their eyes. And as the book teaches us through God's spirit, who uses its words to communicate what God wants us to know about him, and it trains our hearts and our eyes to see properly, finally, after we wait at the fullness of time, here's Jesus. And when you see him, you don't simply see an anointed one who tells us something about God's purposes and salvation. When you see him, you see God. And that is why the son in this case is greater than his father. He's greater than David, for he is one with the father, the eternal son of God. This isn't here to kind of get out of the way so that we can kind of get to Christmas. This is what allows it so that when we get to the New Testament and we pass that little page in your Bible that says New Testament, we flip over, that those guys have something to point to. Passages like this are part of why Paul is so insistent that this gospel that he preaches to us is according to the scriptures. That's the thing he says about it twice. This is setting up all our hopes and our dreams and our anticipation so that when we read about him and thus we see him, our hearts have been trained to judge rightly and to confess about him the things that God has said we ought to confess, the things that really matter. And what's truly astonishing about the book is all that weight of hope and anticipation continues past the resurrection of this slain one to his ascension into heaven and to his return. Waiting is the right posture for reading the narrative because it lets us listen with care. It's the right posture for the Christian life because as he has come, he will come again. This is the confession of the Christian church. Let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you for your goodness, for your word, for its clarity. We thank you that it can train our hearts to see as you do, train our eyes to look on the right things. Help us not to be distracted by all the urgent issues that are right in front of us, deadlines and trips and flights and all the other sorts of things. And help us in this season to be thankful and to prepare our hearts for when the church celebrates the birth of your son, the Lord Jesus Christ who is the son of David, the son of Abraham, who died on the cross for our sins and was raised on the third day in fulfillment of the scriptures. Help us to wait for this with joyful anticipation, to celebrate it with hearts that have been properly informed by your word and your message so that we might sing together with all the saints. Amen. Amen. Go away.